So tonight we have a uh, Lars Giesing, um, you know, presenting to us. Uh, if you're not familiar with Lars's work, it's uh, exceptional, and I saw his uh, one of my favorite images of his pop up right away. You know, um, it's the family bonds, uh, the bison image. I asked him where he took that, and he won't share it with me, so I understand why. <laughs> but Lars is a fine art nature photographer based here in Denver. Um, his images reflect his outlook on life uh, and his personality. Uh, they portray a deep admiration for the beauty hidden in fleeting moments in nature, and they have both visual and spiritual depth. Um, he says where he grew up in northern Germany, Honesty, sincerity, grit, and a down-to-earth mentality are guiding principles. Through his camera, he now takes those traits and turns them into photographic artworks. Lars is fascinated with the concept of finding a home in the rugged beauty of the American West and the individual sacrifices necessary to do so. Consequently, recurring themes in his images are a juxtap juxtaposition strength, mystique, serenity, calm, warmth, intimacy, and resilience. Lars's artworks hang in collectors' homes around the globe, are being exhibited in galleries around the U.S. and beyond, and his work has been published in leading photography, photography magazines. And uh, Lars is currently working on a workshop, workshop and online training series, and I have a handout that he's emailed me and I'll get this to Carl so he can send it out to everyone. Uh, he's working um, on program with the, the main points of this presentation, and then his contact information will be on this with a chance to sign up for his newsletter and find out more about his upcoming uh, photography trainings. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to Lars so he can go into his presentation. Um, and. As Larry mentioned, if you're not muted, please do mute. And then if you would also um, turn off your video chip, that helps you know, conserve some bandwidth. Seems that uh, you know, with everyone on Zoom nowadays, every little bit of bandwidth can help. Um, with that, Lars, I will let you take it away. All righty, let me share my screen here and hopefully this will all work. I wish that we could meet in person, but uh, it is what it is. So here's that. So. Can you all, can you hear me and can you see me? Sean, can you just give me a, a thumbs up or down? Yes. Okay, perfect. Awesome. So um, before I get too much into or to expand on what Sean just uh, told you about myself, um, I kind of want to jump right in and um, get into what I want to talk to you guys about uh, tonight. And that is sort of the concept of telling a story and sort of sharing more than the image itself with your audience and fostering connection um, through that process. So that's something that I take a lot of pride in and really focus on in my work is to create imagery, but then sort of really try and dig deep and ask myself, okay, why, why is this, image speaking to me? Why did I take this in the first place? What makes this special? What about this image stands out to myself? And if I can, if I can then articulate that to other people, then maybe they can see it too. And all of a sudden that image gets a whole different, different kind of meaning. And I, so in my estimation, in my interpretation, that's where taking a photo, the, creating a snapshot of something you saw in nature turns into something more the i realized that sort of the uh borders between photography and art are kind of sometimes not very easy to define and i struggle with it myself but uh for me it's if if the image uh it has something more than just if it's something more than just a pretty picture if that makes sense so with me sort of rambling a little bit about that, let's let's jump right in and let's jump into this into this presentation. And what you see on the screen is my image family bonds, um, and 
I don't remember Sean asking me about whether or not I would share where I took this. I took this at uh, at the Arsenal here, outside, just outside Denver, um, late uh, late last fall. Actually, it was one of the first snowstorms that was uh, rolling in, and I saw that snowstorm in the forecast and uh, drove out there on a Sunday afternoon uh, because I had this concept, this idea in mind of wanting to um, capture the bison in snow. That was all I knew. And so I drove out there and um, this is the image that came out of it. But what this, this is an image that people seem to really like. And I've gotten a lot of positive response to it, which makes me really proud. This was just uh, announced a winner in the Moscow International Photo Festival. It's been, it's being collected by people all around the, all around the globe. It's in, it's, hanging regularly in galleries which is an awesome feeling but when i saw this and this moment didn't last very long of these these by these three bison um lining up perfectly um i thought of something and that is what i want to share with you now and that's the story of behind the image and that sort of is the transition into what i want to talk to you about so this is the image i hope you've had the chance and the time to kind of take a look at it now and really take it in. And this is um, what, when I came back, wrote about the image. This is what I usually do. I, I take a take a photo, go back, kind of look through the images that I got on my on my uh, computer, and then pick the one that I like the best and start writing something about it with the emotions of that day, the feelings of that day still being fresh. So I'm just going to read this. Um, and um, we'll take it from there. When the going gets tough, we turn to the ones we love and trust the most in our lives. That's why I immediately, that's what I immediately thought of when I had the good fortune of witnessing this family of bison brave a thick early season Colorado snowstorm. I had watched the herd for quite a while. At first, these magnificent animals were all dispersed, each minding their own grazing business. But then something beautiful happened. As the snow started falling, even ever more violently, individual family members within the herd started to gravitate toward each other. This family moved in really close and tight to shield each other as much as possible and to give warmth where there was cold. It was moving, to say the least, and a story of a shared overcoming by getting closer to and with the ones we love the most, a show of the powerful bonds and strength of family. What I mean to say by that, by that hug your loved ones tight tonight. Here's the image again, and I hope that you look at it different now, knowing that story behind it. I hope that this image says something more to you and speaks to something deeper than just saying, okay, here's a bunch of bison standing in the cold um, and a photographer who was also being cold. Um, so that is one example. I have two more before we get into some of the, some of the how-tos. This is another one of my of my own personal favorite images and one that people uh, seem to respond to fairly positively. Um, took this last fall down in uh, the San Juans. Um, I'm sure many of you guys have been down there and I'm sure that some of you may even recognize this road. Um, I call it the road less traveled. Um, a lot of what I a lot of what I write about is is personal and sort of what I express through my images is, is very personal. Um, I, as my introduction, as Sean said in my introduction, I am from Germany originally. I've been to, I've been in the US for um, almost eight years now. Um, and so with that in mind, um, my road here uh, has certainly not been conventional. It's not what my parents wanted for me in the first place. Um, but they on board with what I do now, and um, so this is this is another example of of me sharing something personal through through my imagery. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm on my way as an off-sided idiom for our love of taking the scenic route in life. In my case, the road that led me here led me to where I am today. Um, a fine art nature photography was by no means a straight shot, and neither was um, how. I can't really see this right now. I do not. I do now the destination of the path I initially set out on. What led me here instead was an unfailing willingness to follow my passion, to pursue my desire to be close to nature's heart and to not pay too much attention about road conditions along the way. 
it probably comes as little surprise then that Robert Frost's The Road Not Taken um, so, so is somewhat of a scriptural roadmap to how I look out on life. I've even had this famous poem hanging in my bedroom for the longest time. And every morning ritual of, uh, of reminding me to look left and right first, where others may choose to walk in a straight line. My path has certainly not been the most conventional, and I know I'm not alone with that. I have always looked for my own way of doing things. Whether someone considers my way old or new by their standard will be secondary at best to my own decisions, for they are mine to make. I'm proud of the winding road I have taken that led me to where I am today. This image, the road less traveled, is a tribute to all those who are willing to take the risk to get off the main highway and explore their own path. I cannot wait to find out what's around the next corner. Maybe I'll see you there. So again, here's the image. And again, I hope that this is now to you guys more than just an image of pretty aspen trees and a road leading through those aspen trees. I have one more, be, um, so bear with me. This is another one of my personal favorites and it's certainly one that whenever I post it on my social media channels, it kind of wrecks my social media notifications for a few days. Um, I call this solitary. Um, it's pretty clear what it is. It's, I shot this in Rocky Mountain National Park um, at the crack of dawn. Um, and this is the story that I wrote with it. I captured solitary on one of my many early morning fall ventures here in Colorado. On this particular morning, I had driven all the way up to one of the highest points in Rocky Mountain National Park, way before the sun rose in the east. It was the height of the annual elk rut when the chilly early morning air in the park rings with the sound of bugling elk. I had dreamed up the idea of capturing the silhouette of an elk bull against the colorful sky just before sunrise, well aware that pretty much every star in the universe would have to line in order for me to be able to actually eternalize such an incredibly rare and elusive moment. Well, a line they did, and the result is solitary. What drew me to producing an image like this in the first place was that I really wanted to illustrate the journey from darkness to light that dictates so much of my photography. Placing the lone elk in a high, tund high country tundra environment, walking toward, toward the light, however slowly, showcases the journey we all have to take at times. We're struggling, we feel like we're in the dark, unforgiving place alone, but there's always a light and it's all about finding the courage to take the step forward toward the warmth of that light. If you have ever dealt with a challenge or are doing so right now, I hope that Solitary will inspire you to keep fighting, to keep taking that next step. There's always a light. So with everything that's going on right now, this is certainly a very timely issue uh, and a timely uh, image. Um, it's also, in my mind, a very timeless image and just one that I personally love and uh, have hanging in my own house too. Those are three examples sort of of my approach to photography and sort of showing you the finished product once I'm done with everything that I do. Um, so let's break down how I get there. But first, um, after I shared those three, sto uh, those three stories and those three images with you, uh, and without saying too much else about me, um, what have you already learned about me just from these three images? Family is important to me. I value making my own decisions. I'm not too worried about conforming. I'm looking for my own ways through life. I believe in taking risks in life. I've overcome challenges. I'm a fighter. And nature is healing to me. That's a whole lot of information and things that I already shared with you in the five to 10 minutes that I've been talking. And I've only shared three, story, three stories, three images with you. And okay, the bit of information that Sean gave you at the beginning and whatever you may have done in your own research before. But really, these are the takeaways that you can get just from these three images. That's a lot. And in my mind, that's really powerful um, because ultimately, um, how many of you see yourself in at least some of those character traits? Those are not those are not special character traits by any by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I'm a regular guy just going out and taking photos and talking about them afterward. Um, but by doing so, people can and start to relate to my images and they start to relate to them differently because they can see themselves in those images and the conversations that um follow from that are oftentimes so much deeper than uh what they would be if it's just uh just a quick oh this is a, that's a pretty pretty photo or oh this is beautiful 
oftentimes it is sure but there's more to that and once you can share that you can actually have a conversation about um that image and i think that's sort of where the art making process if you want to call it that comes in um so this is what i want to talk to you about tell me a story the art of photographic art and i think i gave you i just gave you three examples of of where this is going um here's a quick rundown um the most impressive most important thing to me is asking why um i do that constantly and i will talk to you more about why that's so important um what makes a good story when we talk about storytelling we should probably um quickly consider okay what actually is a good story um photography as a spiritual practice i'm don't worry i'm not going to talk about um um spiritual practices in in terms of of religious practices but there is something to be said about photography being more than just the act of uh of pressing the shutter and um i think that's super important if you're trying to express yourself through your photography so i want to talk briefly about that um and then uh a few words on how to develop your personal style and um i'm actually going to share one exercise that one of my mentors shared with me on how you can jumpstart that process a little bit. And then I have some more hands-on tips and a Q&A session at the end. Um, if you have questions, um, please put them in the chat box. I don't have the chat box open here right yeah. now because there's already a whole bunch of uh, different um, things that are kind of obstructing my view of the screen a little bit. That's why I struggled with reading those stories a little bit earlier too. Um, but I will, once we get to the end of the presentation, go through those questions and do my level best to, to answer them. And then uh, if any other questions pop up, I have time. I need to pack at some point before tomorrow morning for my camping trip, but I am in no rush. So I am more than happy to talk to you guys as long as you have questions. So that's uh, kind of the, the brief rundown here. I'm just going phone down here so I actually have an idea of how long I've been talking. Um, I do want to give this brief disclaimer. This is what I do personally. It works for me because it is an expression of my personality, but there is no playbook, no step-by-step -step guide to being creative. That's important because um, as much as I love sharing what I do, um, I fully realize that it's not going to apply to everybody. Um, there are some best practices in this presentation i think that you can take away if you like and try to apply it to your own photography but ultimately um i will talk a whole lot about how uh how important it is to uh be personal and be approachable in your photography um and so ultimately we all approach this differently and we all have our own stories to tell and so i will not be able to tell you how to uh tell your story best um there's some, again, some best practices that I want to get into though. So uh, with that disclaimer out of the way, um, this is pretty much uh, what Sean just talked about. And I only put this in here because um, I want to draw a distinction between um, when you talk about yourself, about what's considered a bio, um, your biography, and what's called your mission statement. Um, this is my biography. Um, this sort of has my highs and lows, mostly my highs, because I try to hide my lows, at least in, in my biography. I, I tend to work through my lows in, in my images, so um, I'm willing to share about that. But um, yeah, this is the, so this is the biography. Um, Sean basically just, wrote, uh, ju just read that to you. Um, but um, one thing that's not in there that's super important to uh, sort of my journey, though, is that I used to, um, be a journalist. I have formal training as a journalist. I uh, got my undergrad and my graduate degree both in journalism uh, and that prepared me for what I do today and that is asking why. Um, this goes back to asking that question why. It's always about why. Why is something happening? Why am I uh, attracted to this scene? What am I seeing here? Um, this is my image uprising. I took that uh, earlier this year in. Um, California um, on a on a four day road trip after a um, a gallery showing I had in San Francisco um, and this was just days before uh, 
everything started shutting down and we made it we were back in Denver by that time but it was sort of the last uh the last hurrah for uh quite a few uh quite a few weeks if not months of um doing a lot less photography than what I'm used to um again uh why 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 did I shoot this scene this is the scene why did I decide to to shoot it like that um it was it's a zoomed in shot telephoto shot um, of this of the massive uh, coastline in, in California, Big Sur. Um, and this is what I wrote about it. Where the sea meets the land is where possibility peaks. Cliffs right out of the sea of, out of a sea of opportunity, marking the end of one journey and the beginning of yet another. Here on these ridges, past me, lines between habitats blur, if ever so shortly, and where we go next is entirely ours to decide. The, dan the dancing breeze carries forth spirits rising like the morning fog hugging the land. Listen to the wisdom of the earth, the grace and resilience of the elders that have overseen this elemental rendezvous for centuries. And the way forward just may appear that much clearer. And then there's this sort of addendum uh, that has since, uh, that I've since added to it. Uprising has since become so much more, a testament to the strength of the, hum of the human spirit of always getting back up when, we're beating, when we are beaten down. So I had named this, this image Uprising, um, and I had written what I first read to you, but then I, as I kept thinking about it, um, its meaning to, my, to me, to myself, kind of changed uh, or transformed, evolved uh, um, a little bit more. And that sort of, it, it really shows the, the strength. It, for me, it really shows the strength um, that everybody felt at, that I certainly felt at that point we were kind of before the the uh the pandemic and I had named this image uprising and uh as I kept thinking about what uprising means today compared to what it did back then uh it was hard for me not to think about the strength of of the human spirit and sort of this this very as I've come to learn very American uh um trait of uh pulling together and pulling through um, tough and challenging times. And that fits really well with um, sort of what I am drawn to here and what I'm trying to, to talk about in my, in my imagery in general. And that is sort of this, uh, as Sean said, this, this, um, this, this fight, uh, this, this constant struggle of, of making, making do with the land and sort of overcoming whatever the land is throwing at you and what mother nature is throwing at you in terms of weather, in terms of harsh conditions, um, the whole story of, of, uh, of developing and, uh, and exploring the American West to begin with is something that has always fascinated me and that I explore very differently now than I did when I was a boy. And it was all about, uh, stories of, about, Cowboys and Indians, um, that certainly uh, my view has, has changed or evolved on that. Um, but again, it's all about why did I take that photo? Why, why is this an important image to me? And, then, and by extension, why should anyone else care about it? So we've all heard a picture is worth a thousand words, um, but there is more to it. Visuals and words complement each other when used right. They both have their own strengths. So it's you will, even the best storyteller will not likely be able to rec recreate a visual image uh, just, uh, just right. But if you, if you use both together, which is what I'm trying to do, um, then you can create something that's, that's special and that sort of comes to life and has emotion. And that, again, goes by asking why. Um, that reflex of curiosity um, that we've all had as children and uh, some of us, a lot of us have um, kept that, that sense of curiosity and that uh, always wanting to know what's going on and why something is happening. Um, and I truly believe that if you want to become an expressive nature photography, which I consider myself, then that's that worried that question why is the most powerful question that you can ask yourself um and it's easy to ask but very hard to answer and uh it's very personal to answer and uh, your 
answers to the question why you like an image or don't like an image of the ones, just the ones that I just showed you may be very different from what I just told you. And that's fine. Like there is no right or wrong uh, answer when it comes to this, which makes my life very easy in some regards because I can't really screw things up. I can always say, well, that's what I think and that's why I like it. And if you don't like it, then so be it. At the same time, it also is really hard because it's a personal thing to do and you're kind of putting yourself out there and you're putting everything out there. Um, but again, why are you putting that in, in your frame? Why is something going in and something is not going in? That needs to be a, a very conscious choice and you need to, uh, you need to think about that, I think, uh, to uh, give an image uh, real meaning. Um, because the why ultimately, it informs what we want to say with our image, as I've said. Uh, if we don't have anything to say, um, we are perceived as boring, as shallow. So we're just kind of like, uh, yeah, okay, he doesn't have a story. He is just, he's just sitting there. He's, we don't pay attention to those kinds of people, and we won't pay attention ultimately to those kinds of images. There's very few images that um, people will remember in the flood of, of images in the digital age um, that will continue to be remembered that don't have something more than just the it factor and the uh being being a pretty pretty image a uh, pretty shot um so and again it starts with your mission um and that's sort of the jump now from the biography to um to the mission part and the mission statement and uh it's about what you believe in um who you are as a person um why you choose to photograph, why you choose to go out in nature, why you choose to get up at 3 a.m. to be at the trailhead by 4, to be at the, um, at the spot where you want to photograph sunrise at 5 a.m. when everybody else is sleeping for four more hours. Why do you do that? And nobody else can answer that for you. And I would almost guarantee if you really dug deep, uh, then your answers will all individually be different. Um, we all like um, nature that's not enough that's not a mission statement it has to be something that is uh that goes deeper than that and i will share mine in a second and then uh we can we can take it from there but the ugly truth is and i do believe this and this is something that um i heard chris burkard uh which some of you or a lot of you may be uh familiar with um saying that if you can't boil down what drives you into uh, into a mission statement your passion likely won't last things easily become mundane. I think he has a, he has a strong point there in that um, only the things that really drive us deep down are the ones that we're going to stick with. Otherwise, it's so easy these days to um, become distracted and pick up a new hobby along the way or uh, kind of get thrown by the wayside once things get hard, once, once life uh, gets in the way. Um, if photography is more than that for you then you will be able to answer that question what do you believe in why do you do this um if not it's okay too um but yeah if if this is something that really drives you deep down then uh i challenge you to at least explore that question and think about why you photograph and think about it deeper than there has to be something deep down that that drives most if not all of us um and that will change over time um it has changed with me in just a few years and i'm sure it, it'll keep changing um and i constantly re-ask myself uh, that question and the mission statement that i'm about to share with you for me has changed has changed multiple times in just the last few years um and i think that that's perfectly fine there's um life throws things at you and you grow as a person and I grow as a person. And so why should your, your motivation and your uh, sort of your journey not be reflected in what you do? Um, and ultimately that really reflects uh, or informs every image that you take subconsciously. It's not, Oh, I need to take an image that is in line with my mission statement, but it's if you were able to, um, 
really talk, uh, really think and formulate what it is that drives you, then you will be able to easily link almost every image, at least every image that you like, every image, every image that sticks, um, you will be able to link back to your uh, response to, to that why. Um, and then by extension, if you communicate that why to your audience repeatedly, um, your images will come to life and they will uh, become real in the sense that it's otherwise very hard to stand out in the age of social media and digital images where there's just such a flood that it's just so hard to even get the time, uh, time of day from people to, um, to uh, interact with your, with your image or to really try and understand what you're doing there. But this is basically uh, my mission statement, or it is my mission statement, and it's on my website too. Um, and I want to read it to you so you can get a sense of what I've been talking about and trying to explain to you guys. So life in the American West has always been about overcoming challenges. It's fueled by a shared appreciation for hard work, for self-invention, for grit and determination, for living with the land and the elements. People choose to build a life here for what they like to refer to as its rugged beauty. But with that ruggedness come challenges, come trade-offs, come, come sacrifices. Yet for the love of the land, for the love of place, we choose again and again the bravery to overcome because we know deep down that ultimately we are better for it. We overcome so we can feel home, truly home. When I was 24, I left behind my life and my loved ones in my native Germany to dedicate my life to finding a sense of home in the American West and showcasing its rugged beauty to the world. This trade-off, the never-ending the never -ending struggle to sacrifice for our most innate desires is the foundation of each of my artworks because the connection that we feel to the natural world around us we just far beyond time spent outside. It defines who we really are, how we really feel, what we really do. It gives us a sense of purpose. It gives us a sense of home. I hope that this communicates to you and anyone who reads this, listens to this, that nature to me and taking photos in nature and making, making images for people's homes, for galleries, um, is something that I do out of more than just uh, sort of the the love for for the process of doing it, um, and that ties into um, this this spiritual practice almost that I want to talk to you uh, to you about later. But so this is my mission statement. Um, I believe that this presentation is going to be shared again. It's on my website too. The handout will have the link to my website. Um, you can see this and always feel free to reach out to me even after this presentation. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to, to answer them. Um, but so here's another uh, image that kind of speaks directly to uh, this mission statement of mine. So I included it here, I call it stalwart. Um, um, I took it last year down in um, uh, the garden of the gods in Colorado Springs. Sometimes we may not find ourselves in the most comfortable of spaces and situations, yet we still persevere. We put both feet off on the ground as best as we can, and we soldier on because we know the reward of doing so will eventually outweigh the short-term discomfort. Living in the mountains or wherever it is that makes us happy, living a life of few regrets is all about navigating short-lived pain and discomfort as a trade-off for joy and happiness in the long run. It's the reason why at the end of a long, hard day, we lift our feet off the ground, put them up, and we feel a sense of accomplishment, of pride and joy and self-worth. That is everything, or a lot of uh, the things at least that I saw in this tree, sort of clinging on for dear life, you could say, or growing proudly out of sheer red rock formations and not seemingly caring about uh, being cold and snowed on uh, because he likes where he is. A lot of times this sounds kind of simple when you just uh, when you just talk about it, but uh, when you then start to think about it more deeply and what sort of those those simple ideas and and images that come to your mind um, when you see something, um, uh, what that means to you, um, you start to come up with those uh, with something like what I wrote about it. This is not. By any means, I'm not looking at this tree, and uh, then I put pen to paper immediately right there and, and put this and put this down. But I do take notes on location usually, and then afterward, as I said, I sit down and think about the why. Think about why um, this 
is an important image to me that sort of says something more than um, all the other ones that I took because like everyone else, I take thousands of photos every month and at the end of the month, I like one or two. So um, most of the photos that I take don't get the pretty words uh, attached to them. They never see the light of day either. So um, it's the ones that stand out. And once they stand out, once you identify them as the ones standing out, you got to ask yourself why. Why do these stand out? Why do they stand out to me? If you can um, formulate that to yourself, then you will most likely not be able to um, tell somebody else why they should care about that photograph. So what makes a good story? Um, ultimately, details make a, make a story interesting. Um, you can tell stories better when you're aware of and take note of how you're feeling in the moment, when you can articulate your passion to yourself. That's sort of what I was just talking about. You can go out to, uh, to a waterfall and take a, a photo of a waterfall. You can freeze the motion for a second and get those nice, silky waterfalls. Um, Everybody does that these days. Um, you see millions and millions of photographs of, of uh, um, waterfalls on on the internet uh, and wherever you look that have that uh, smooth, silky water. And even though it's always exciting to see that, ultimately we all like waterfalls. That's not enough to make your image stand out. There has to be something more. Um, and you need to define that. Um, Ultimately, um, what makes a good story, there's different ways to figure out what draws you to a scene. Um, and one thing that I usually do um, when I get to um, a location is something that I learned when I was working uh, in, in television news um, and working a lot with uh, the uh, camera people there. Um, something they do is they always start with a wide shot and establishing shot, sort of getting a, getting a sense for where the scene is. Uh, what the scene is, and then they get in closer and closer and closer. They go, they go from big to small. Um, and ultimately, it's those little details that will make the story better. So you start with the 50 millimeter view of, of your eyesight um, just by showing up and kind of getting an idea of, okay, where are you? Um, then you grab the wide angle lens, at least when we talk about landscape photography and try and find a good composition that's, that's pleasing to you. Um, and then as you start to spend some time on, on location, you start to pay attention to and notice details. And that's, what I, that's, that's when I start to get excited, is once I have sort of the establishing stuff out of the way and uh, I can start to really ask myself, why am I so blown away by this, by this specific location? And I usually try and extract that through details. And I usually try to extract those details with my 70 to 200 millimeter. And uh, probably when I look through my portfolio, I would say that at least 50% of the images in there or the ones that I really like um, will be captured with the 70 to 200 millimeter. Um, it's just, uh, it's a personal thing. I fully realize that. I'm not arguing that everybody needs to do that, but if you want to focus on details, um, that will be a good, uh, a good tool to use. So this is what I was talking about. Um, here's two different stories to tell from the same location. This is just from last weekend. I went to um, Rifle State Park. Um, and spent some time there with with those waterfalls. It's, it was the first time actually that I uh, was ever at that location, and it's awesome. There's these, there's actually three waterfalls. I cropped one out because I like this uh, um, this composition on the left better. It's shot with a wide angle lens, um, and it's sort of <laughs> yeah. This, these two images are uh, sort of the tale of two stories, like I like I write on here. The, and, and it's about, again, it's about how you tell a story. Do you tell a story by saying, I went to see these waterfalls and they were amazing. And you don't include any details. That's where your storytelling stops. Will people really start to respond to that? Again, remind yourself, everybody likes waterfalls. If you don't like waterfalls, then in my mind, there's something wrong with you. Um, but that's just me. I hope I didn't offend anybody else. Or do you start to include details in your storytelling? And that goes for your photography as well. And that's the image on the right. I, 
I'm in love with that image. I've been obsessing over it all week. Um, and that's this, this is not the ultimate um, story that I will write with it and uh, put with it once I uh, actually publish it on my portfolio. So you guys are actually the first ones that I'm showing this to. Um, but just to illustrate, this is the same location. This is when you look at the, at the right of the two waterfalls that you see in the left image. Um, if you stand to the right of that waterfall uh, and zoom in really tight with the telephoto, again, the 70 to 200, um, all of a sudden, here's, here's a story. I went to see these waterfalls and they were amazing. Duh. The way the water fell onto the rock with greenery growing in between the light hitting the water, it looked like an angel was landing on the rock slowly, steadily. It was magical, ethereal, like all the, the elements were coming together in one place. That's sort of what I see in that image. People may not see that and that's okay too, but that's what this image says to me and that's that's the the deeper meaning in in that image to me that that detail that makes that place come alive to me there's more than than a couple or three awesome waterfalls all of a sudden there's there's this scene and it and it's just one scene i'm sure that had i spent two days there instead of a couple hours i probably would have found a couple other ones uh, of these of these scenes at least at least i would like to think that i did um, but as I said, that practice takes time. Um, I often spend hours on location and I most often shoot by myself so I don't get rushed. Um, because I'm not the fastest one to sort of process a scene. I know of myself that I need to spend time somewhere. I need to sort of get that giddy awe out of my way when I go to a location and I see these awesome waterfalls and I'm just uh, over the moon like everybody else is but then the challenge for me starts and I'm like okay now I got the establishing shot so let's see what let's see what kind of like details we can find uh, and again it starts by asking myself why do I like this place so much what is it about this place and then uh, it's, uh, it goes from there. Um, and I think what you may have taken away from this by now is that when I talk about storytelling, uh, I talk about telling stories more in concepts and ideas uh, than in what's obvious. When I talk about these waterfall images, I only briefly, peripherally uh, mention that, well, this is a waterfall. Oftentimes it's not uh, important to the story of what's actually um, being shot there. It's more the concept, the idea behind um, what you see. Uh, and again, this is personal, so there are no wrongs or rights. Um, it's just about yourself. And uh, if you respond to it positively, chances are people will too. Um, oftentimes people don't, and you will just have to have a thick skin. And um, there's plenty of people. Um, there's, I submit my work to art shows all over the country all the time. And more often than not, uh, jurors will tell me that they did not include my image in a show uh, that has various reasons oftentimes it's just because they didn't see what i see in that image and that's i can't blame them um so it's just some it's just part of the game uh, but every so often there's there's an image that comes along like family bonds for example where uh there seems to be fairly universal consensus around uh that there is a real emotional connection to that image um which those are the real keepers, uh, in my opinion, at least. Um, so it becomes about um, the outcome representing your individual experience. Um, I'm not a documentary photographer. I'm not a news photographer by any, by any stretch of the imagination. I'm not trying to accurately represent what I saw um, or what everybody could see. I'm trying to represent what I saw, um, and that can be very, very different from what everybody else saw, uh, and that's fine. And I would argue that's that's where your your style, your personal photography comes uh, comes to life. Um, again, this is this is the image. Uh, it's going to be part of one of my uh, upcoming uh, collections, and I'm tentatively calling it Angels Landing based on the story that I just shared with you. Um, there's one other thing, just kind of as a side note, um, that when it comes to finding these types of scenes it's good to just throw the rule book out of the window. Um, I'm pretty sure that every one of you has uh, learned at some point that uh, you shoot waterfalls uh, in overcast conditions, or at least not during direct uh, sunlight during midday. Well, 
that shot was taken at roughly 1 p.m. Uh, there was not a cloud in the sky, um, but it worked. Um, as the storm had long passed. Uh, I went there because I thought, okay, it's going to be overcast, and I can shoot some shoot some um, some waterfall images because I also am aware of those rules. But uh, I didn't stop shooting after uh, the sun broke through, and actually. Um, the way that the sun now illuminates these two waterfalls while everyone everything else is kind of in the shadows still except for that top part of of the greenery uh growing on that on that rock formation there that's what really makes this image come to life i have that same image from 20 minutes earlier when uh when there was a cloud covering the the sun and it just looks flat so all of that is to say um adapt to the situation that you find don't uh don't stick to the rule book too much. It's a guidebook more than a rule book in nature photography. And I would argue almost anything. Here's some inspirational quotes. At least I think they're inspirational. They inspire me. Uh, people who are much smarter than I am who uh, talk about this stuff that I'm trying to talk, to, talk about here. So like Pico Aya, for example, um, the British essayist. Um, Storytelling happens through introspection, through processing the experience. Um, I have to hold on one second. Okay, here we go. Um, just buying a plane ticket and going to a place doesn't make you a better person. You have to process what you experience, think about what drew you to the place in the first place and see where you may maybe fell short, where your expectations were exceeded. I will go back into full screen here in a second. Um, I just can't read uh, what is on the screen because the, oh. I just figured it out. Hallelujah. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Um, no one ever takes photographs of things they want to forget, says a wise man or woman. I don't know uh, who actually said this. I just wrote it down at some point, uh, found it in my notes in my phone, and thought, hey, this might actually um, apply to what I'm talking about today. So um, there it is. Um, not once have I picked up the camera with the intent of telling the truth. That's what a fellow for Denver photography um, actually said. Uh, I am not going to. Uh, name him here because uh that might be not so good for his business but um yeah i think there's a lot of truth in that uh, that you don't have to be a document documentarian in in your uh, approach to photography by any means rather i identify with what ansel adams said you bring uh, to photography everything that is going on in your life that's the personal part the introspective part um and Again, the camera is a mirror, it points both ways, says somebody who is unknown, at least to me. Um, I can't for the life of me find uh, who said this. Um, it's true nonetheless, in my mind. Um, here are some lessons, some hard learned lessons uh, that I sort of had to figure out along the way. Um, when it comes to writing this stuff, I am. I'm a writer, so uh, the writing stuff, uh, the the writing, the stories that go with these images actually comes fairly easy to me, just because that's what I've always done. That's what I've done even before I started photography. Um, so, but I honestly I, I truly believe that you don't have to um, be a writer or a poet or a novelist, um, which I certainly am not. Um, to do this kind of stuff you just have to be honest uh you have to share your feelings and you have to share them sincerely because if you start to talk about stuff that you think people want to hear that fakery is going to debunk very very quickly and you're going to be tossed aside uh and never to be looked at again and uh don't do that uh you have to be an open book again this is personal so you have to put yourself out there you have to have that thick skin of living through people responding to your images and not only not seeing what you saw but telling you that what you did sucked and that's fine too that's their opinion they, it just doesn't speak to them there's billions of people uh out uh everywhere who you can reach uh and if there's some who don't respond you don't have to please everybody if you can find a sizable group of people who you are uh who your images speak to then you're doing something right um but the way to get there is uh, you have to make this relevant to, to people. People, and in these days, unfortunately, social media algorithms uh, always ask, how is this relevant to me? How is this relevant to people? 
there needs to be a connection. And in the case of photography, it most often has to be an emotional connection, um, as I've talked about all this time. Um, if people don't respond to your images, they are just going to keep scrolling. They're going to like toss that image aside and it's never going to be seen again. And um, in the case of, in the unfortunate case of social media algorithms now, if the first few people who uh, see this uh, in the beginning, right after you posted that image, if they decide, okay, this is not worth my time, then the algorithms won't even show that image to as many people. Um, which becomes a really frustrating exercise uh, and there's a whole different discussion, but it just goes to, goes to the point of, of saying there needs to be a wow factor um, so that people stop in their tracks and then there needs to immediately be something more than that so that they don't, once they stop for a second, just keep moving. You want them to stay with you. You want them to stay with your image. You want them to, to engage with your platform, with, with your personality and ideally you want them to reach out and, um, via comment, via email, whatever, and start talking to you about uh, what you're actually doing. Um, and that's a hard thing to do for uh, somebody like me, certainly, who uh, would consider himself an introvert more than anything, um, that uh, even though I have a, a background in storytelling, uh, that part that putting myself out there is still something that is doesn't come easy to me. Uh, I was nervous for at least the last hour before I jumped on this call with you. Um, I think in some ways it's good that I'm just uh, staring at a blank screen here and just staring at my notes rather than a, full, a room full of people. I'm certainly better in, uh, in um, quiet mountain areas with not a whole lot of people around. But um, yeah, I hope that you guys see something in this and take something away from this. Um, this is another one of my personal favorite images and one that people uh, seem to like. I called it the fantasy, uh, the fantasy. Took a last year too on that same trip down to the San Juans. Um, this is what I wrote. The fantasy is an attempt to make you dream. What you see is real, of course, it is a photograph and yet there is an additional layer, a stunning fall scene reflected purely on water gives me the comfort of knowing what is there while also considering while also considering how well fluid and short-lived this most stunning season is. Just think about it. One breeze and the reflection is gone. There's a lot of beauty in the temporary, which is what draws me back into nature again and again. We visit a place repeatedly, and it will never look exactly the same. How, comf how comforting that is to know we will never run out of wonder, if only we ever let it happen to us. Again, do you look at this image different now than you did before? I do. When we talk about that image, notice how I am not once talk about where that image was made, how early I got up and to get it, or how hard the hike was. By talking about what I'm feeling and what that image means to me, somebody who isn't as fortunate to have that place within driving distance can still relate to it and is more likely to have a deeper connection to it. That is important. Not everybody is, has the good fortunes of living in so such close proximity to to these places and ideally you would want your images to also speak to the ones uh um who are farther away and ideally again you would want them to not feel a sense of jealousy um so much as a sense of connection to the place even though they've never even stood in that place themselves um and i do think a way to do that is to try and write uh, conversational. We all have different writing styles, uh, but you want the image to speak to the viewer, and so you have to speak to that person. Um, and you speak to that person primarily through what you write, the caption, the uh, whatever you, whatever outlet you choose uh, to to put your writings with with your image, uh, your story with your image. Um, and then this is also something that's just driving me crazy and uh, that I myself sometimes fall uh, prey to as well when I'm uh, being lazy in the mornings and just uh, coming up with captions on the fly for my social media posts. But by all, like, by all means, please try and avoid um, the social media hyperbole and superlatives uh, and just share honest feelings about your images. It's just so much more meaningful. I mean, there's... And all these images about best sunrises ever and oh this was this was so amazing and yada 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 we've all seen that a gazillion times and it doesn't really say anything and it, it's not it's not the reality of of what we're trying to communicate either but because i mean most of us have been out for sunrise shooting and 
the reality is that a lot of them actually kind of suck. Um, there's no clouds in the sky, so uh, it's all kind of boring. It's a nice, nice enough scene, but not a good photograph. And then, so you have to get creative. Talk about how you got creative, um, what you did, what drew you to uh, not packing up and uh, getting coffee instead, uh, but sticking around and finding something else. I think that's a much more powerful story to tell than uh, than misleading people about the quality of uh, your every morning sunrise uh, photography outing. All right, let's get to this part. Uh, stick with me. Um, I'm trying to make it short, but I think this is super important. Um, photography is a spiritual practice. Um, it's important when you're trying to figure out, okay, what, I, what is it? Why am I, why am I drawn to a scene uh, to figure out uh, what it is that you're feeling in the moment and you have to be willing to let that happen to you. That's not going to happen as soon as you step foot into uh, a crowded uh, overview of a, of a parking lot or a national park. Um, you have to slow down. Um, and there's this concept of gap of being grounded, aware and present uh, in nature that I try to remind myself as much as I can whenever I'm out. Um, that's again, it's a, it's a guide, uh, take it for what it's worth. It's not a rule by any means, but I find that whenever I'm allowing myself to take two breaths, uh, before, uh, starting to get all, uh, nerdy about photography and trying to figure out, okay, what, what is it I'm trying to do here? Um, that if I, uh, sort of take everything in and take a moment and let my mind rest for a second, that oftentimes that helps increase the quality of the ultimate products tremendously. Um, and so it's this mission uh, or this, this idea that photographers go, photographers go out with a mission to take rather than to receive. We're out to take photos. Um, that's true. I mean, we are. Um, but I challenge you to try and uh, pay attention to the moments that make, your, uh, uh, make you turn your head, that make you say, wow. And then always, 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 uh, if you can, take a photo, make a photo. Um, don't worry about whether it's good or bad, but I firmly believe, and it has worked for me, uh, that it is about uh, training yourself to sort of be, as I write here, about being taken rather than taking a photo. So you have to be taken by something first in order to be able to then uh, try and take a photo of it and create something lasting from that uh, fleeting moment. Uh, I think that, that there is a lot of uh, wisdom in this, and this is something that I forget the name of the, of the guy. I listened to a podcast uh, and somebody who specializes in this and they actually work with um, um, coaches to, uh, to with mindful practices and all of that stuff. That's not how far I go, but these are sort of the, the surface level um, lessons that I took away from, from that very interesting conversation. Um, and it's about showing up a neutral uh, with no expectations, no wanting and no gaining from going somewhere. Um, I fail at that probably 75% of the time. I go somewhere and I have a shot in mind that I want to get. And uh, at least I can tell myself that more often than not, I get that shot and it's not the one that I, uh, after I get back home, I'm most in love with. So um, I think there is sort of that journey at least towards allowing my mind to not be completely um, preoccupied with, oh, there's these three waterfalls at Rifle Falls. So I gotta make sure that I get a really awesome like wide shot or this panoramic shot um, to show these, these falls. You have to actually get there. You actually have to, have to actually stand there and ask yourself, why, why am I blown away right now? What, what, what makes me say wow? Um, and then uh, start taking photos of that. And then you start coming away with images like Angel's Landing um, that I showed you earlier. And what helps, even though, again, this is uh, a much easier said than done, is to stop worrying, <laughs> worrying about what everybody thinks. Uh, make, it about what you, make it about you and what you are feeling. That's what I've been talking about for this, uh, these past 45 or so minutes. Um, it's so much harder. Um, we all want to be liked, and we put our heart and souls into these images, and getting uh, rejected for them is 
about as painful uh, an experience um, in this field, at least, as, as there is. And so I, if anybody tells you that uh, they stopped completely worrying about what other people think about them, whew, I don't know if I believe that person, but uh, I'd like to keep that in mind, at least, as sort of a, a goal to ins- aspire to more than anything. Um, because ultimately, there is the therapeutic nature of photography. It's it's a creative outlet. It's it's we're putting ourselves out there and uh, getting in touch with 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 ourselves and sort of going through and uh, pushing aside all the all the stress and all the clutter of of everyday life. That is something that I truly believe in, and that's what draws me back to photography as as an outlet again and again. Is that I get to sit there and spend a couple hours and just the world around me kind of stops to exist uh, much to the um, disdain of my wife at some point, uh, sometimes because I lose track of time and she gets cold um, and then um, I get into trouble. But um, art is the highest form of hope, says Gerhard Richter, a German artist. If you haven't looked him up uh, or if you don't know him, look him up. Um, His work is amazing. Um, There's a lot of truth in that. How to develop your personal style. Um, I'm sure you've all heard it only comes with time and that's kind of like, okay, yeah, whatever. Um, That's a non-response really. It's true, but also like that doesn't help anybody. Um, Two more actionable uh, things that I've heard and applied uh, myself is if you want to develop your personal style, go on an extended road trip if you can. Uh, Take more than an afternoon to go out and shoot, but take a few days, a few weeks if you can, and spend it on photography. And then go back and uh, evaluate your body of work uh, that you came home with and sort of see what you like about it. across the board and uh again i think the most important thing is to be intentional about um about it and uh about what what it is that you like what it is that you don't like um and there's a simple exercise um that helps with that that one of my mentors uh actually shared with me and that's uh if you want to do this i did this i continue to do this um after I completed this first exercise, but for a few weeks, um, create a, a folder on your desktop. Uh, and just whenever you see an image that somehow speaks to you, uh, just copy and paste it in there for now. It can be on Facebook when you scroll on Facebook or you see wherever you go to look at photos, um, try and just copy it in there. Don't use those images for anything because it would be a copyright infringement. But, um, if you just keep them on your, on your, uh, desktop folder, um, you're in the clear. Um, don't be too worried about um, the category of photos. It doesn't have, even if you consider yourself a landscape photographer, don't, or a nature photography, don't just go for, for nature photos. Go for anything where you, with that kind of makes you stop in your tracks, every photo that makes you stop in your tracks and says, wow, okay, this is awesome. Just save it until you get to 50 to 100 images, however long you want to do this. Um, and if you can, afterward, print them out and take the time, take an afternoon, and write out on the back of them, uh, on each of them, what inspired you about it. Again, it's about being intentional about what you like about photography, about certain photos, and what you don't like about others. Um, And once you then start to type those up, uh, however you like to do it, you can create just an Excel spreadsheet, a very simple one. Um, You will start to notice sooner rather than later recurring themes, ideas, and the like. Uh, And if you focus on producing similar imagery, for me it was a lot of this detail work and a lot of sort of the more ethereal, mystical um, ideas behind photography rather than just the um, head-on awesome panorama or or vista shot uh in landscape photography even though i do those myself as well um if there's something that draws me to them so it's not by all means don't just go out and and only look for one specific type of image uh but it helps to be aware of what you like um and to for to be able to formulate that um 
because only then can you ultimately uh, try and uh, start shooting like that yourself if you so choose. So here's a few more hands-on tips. And I'm sort of getting toward the end of this presentation. So if you are getting uh, restless, bear with me for a few more minutes. Um, here's my image family bonds again. And I don't usually do this, but I also feel completely comfortable doing this. Um, on the left is the raw file, completely unedited, straight out of camera. And on the right is uh, the final image um, that I posted and that I have in my portfolio and that I submit to, again, to galleries, to photo competitions around the world and uh, get a lot of positive feedback on. Um, the lesson here is that if this type of photography is for you, if it's more of an expression of your own personality rather than documentary, style which again both types are fine it's just that for me personally um it's the the creative the expressive um way of doing things then you have to allow yourself to get creative with post-processing too you set the rules and only you um it's the post-processing process ultimately is for recreate and recreating emo the emotions of the moment and not sticking to rules that somebody in a photography forum once told you um, if the image is working better after you're done editing it for you then the image is better and then those techniques worked i think that's super important because here this is an image that can't enter into every contest around the world because i did some as you see some fairly heavy editing here um i uh blew out a lot of the highlights around the bison family because I wanted to really drive home this point of whiteout conditions and it, it being cold. White can be perceived as a cold color. Um, and that, that worked best with me by just surrounding this family of bison by as much white as possible. Um, and it just amplifies the, the shapes two that ultimately make this i think a, a, a pretty good image is just that they lined up perfectly and they only were for a few minutes but it's simplifying simplifying the message simplifying um what you're trying to say and really focusing on what you're trying to say and using editing techniques um to achieve that um and again if that means you have to um remove a whole bunch of uh of grass uh that is around uh those bison to drive home that point then uh you've got yourself a fine art image um it's not a you can you can enter it into a, a, a wildlife competition at the uh um at a conservation group maybe um because oftentimes you got to read the rules and um there are rules about post-processing and those are fine. Um, again, it's uh, everybody's personal choice on how to process uh, the images. I am certainly one who is, uh, who doesn't give too, who doesn't care too much about the rules when it comes to post-processing. To me, it's, it's all about the why. Why is this an important image to me? Um, and why does this image speak to me? And, uh, I will use every tool in my arsenal to drive home that that uh, message and that story. Um, and whoever gets in the way of that, if I lose some some people along the way, then um, so be it. Um, another tip um, is to experiment with different aspect ratios. This is something that I uh, do a lot as well. We are all conditioned to seeing three by two images. Um, this is standard. Some Uh, brought about the um, vertical image or the, the, the square image as the preferred choice. I shoot a lot of landscape and nature uh, scenes, and so I often, often, often shoot in two by one, three by one, or even four by one. Four by ones are tough to post anywhere, to put anywhere on the internet. Um, because they have to be viewed in fairly large in order to be appreciated. But honestly, 4 by ones are some of my favorite images. This, uh, this one is another like fairly recent uh, image that I haven't shown to anybody else yet, but that is going uh, into uh, one of my upcoming uh, collections soon. Um, 
and that sense of space in in that uh in that environment just needed to be shown by uh that four by one perspective in my mind it was it's it's a stitched image ultimately it's i don't know 15 single exposures so that i can print this really big um my plan is to actually print this and hang this in uh the living room of our new house um so this is another one of my images right now that i'm uh really proud of um and i think it works really well because of the aspect ratio that i uh chose for it so i thought i'd share that with you um what else take notes um yes we've thought i've talked at length by now about how important it is that you become aware of uh, what it is you're feeling in the moment and what it is that draws you to an image. And at least for me, in order to successfully communicate that after the fact, I always uh, take notes when I'm on, on location. I have a little notebook in my camera back that I use for that sometimes if I'm being very diligent more often than not, once I'm back in the parking lot and sitting back in my car before I leave, um, I take five to 10 minutes um, and just type a few uh, notes um, into my phone um, just so that I remember um, what it is I felt in that moment because uh, the, 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 the earlier you can go through the process of uh, writing out um, intentionally what you felt in a moment the more real it will feel uh, the more time you let pass uh, the more it just kind of becomes a distant memory and harder to describe for yourself and thereby harder uh, to describe to other people so i think that's a pretty important technique to apply if you want to um if you want to um explore your why um, for any given photo and it doesn't have to be perfect for me it's also just notes at that point um, Sometimes it's keywords, sometimes it's phrases, sometimes it's sentences, sometimes it's quotes that I think about. Whatever it is, just throw it in, throw it in your phone, throw it on a piece of paper. Uh, it only takes five minutes. Chances are you have five more minutes to spare. Um, it'll help you. It'll help you in the editing process afterward too, because the editing process, as I just said, is there in my mind to drive home the message of the image, and it becomes much easier to do so if you actually already know what the what the message of the image is and uh your notes will will help you with that uh don't be afraid of long lens and landscape photography i already talked about this um quite a bit that my favorite uh lens to shoot with is my 70 to 200. um i know what each lens lens in my camera bag can do and what it's good at and sort of the optical uh visual um effects that it creates um and i just really like the the look of the 70 to 200 and extracting details from a scene um to tell the story through details again um let's see is there anything else in here that i um yeah don't be afraid to use the telephoto lens and landscape photography again i use it all the time uh even though um every uh lens salesman will tell you that uh, the first lens that you will need for landscape photography is a wide lens um, they might not be wrong but uh, if you can swing it uh, i think a 70 to 200 or a zoom lens it doesn't have to be the 70 to 200 it's just the one that i use um, any kind of zoom lens that gets you in lets you get in close and extract details uh, will broaden your arsenal of photo techniques a whole lot um nature poses too and those poses tell a story i think that this is super interesting and this is something that i'm still um exploring for myself too and sort of the the concepts um the design concepts if you will behind um that you can that you can see in nature uh, to me it's more of a of a personal response not always being fully aware of a design principle behind why I like something, but there usually is. I mean, it's whether it's lines or patterns or shapes, that's something if you want to look for details, those are good things to look out for because they are aesthetically pleasing and they usually make for very good images, but just vertical lines, um, they show power, they show, show strength and dominance. Um, it's this concept of looking up to your elders, um, as a sign of authority and control um 
subjects with vertical lines do the same. Like in this this image, a lot of uh, vertical uh, lines with with these trees uh, growing on a on a hillside and the fog kind of lingering and um, resting on the tips of of the individual branches. Um, trees and mountains, as I just said, they portray this dominance. That's why they appear dominant to us. That's why a tree appears so visually uh, impressive to us um, because it's this dominance. Uh, when people stand tall, it represents pride. And animals do the same thing. Um, they go into a vertical stance to ward off predators or to show dominance. Again, if you've ever seen a, a bear on uh, standing up, uh, I hope you did so from a safe distance. Um, they want to make sure that you see them and they want to show who's boss. Um, so it's a concept to keep in mind. And then there's color um, to tell stories. And this is something, um, this is something that I used to have um, taped to the wall uh, over my editing screen uh, because um, learning about what color does um, is, uh, and sort of the different emotions and effects that colors have on, on people's uh, feelings is a super powerful tool to, to know and to communicate with. And this is something that I just, uh, if you just Google um, colors and psychologic effects or something like that and click on images, there's going to be a whole bunch of these uh, that will pop up and you can print it out for yourself and sort of spend, I encourage you to spend some time with these charts and sort of really think through, okay, um, what is my color? Um, what is the color that I'm often drawn to? What is my favorite color? Uh, what does it say about, uh, about myself? Um, and you might actually come across with some interesting uh, answers. And in my case, it's my favorite color is orange. Uh, it says here it's uh, confidence, success, bravery, and sociability. Uh, I would argue that the majority of those uh, attributes actually do not necessarily apply to me. Um, but I'm still drawn to orange. So what does it say about me? Um, I think being aware of aware of that is is a good thing. Um, yeah. So sorry, I just dumped a whole lot of information uh, on you guys, or more so, uh, rambled on for about an hour um, or more. Um, I hope that it was uh, somewhat uh, interesting to you guys. Uh, let me get out of here real quick and see what I have to do to get the chat window back. Um, because now would be a good time if there isn't one already. Uh, okay, perfect, yeah. Uh, now would be a great time to um, share your thoughts or uh, ask questions. Again, I have uh, time and I'm happy to uh, stick around for uh, as long as there are questions. Um, yeah, Large thanks so much for listening. I hope this was somewhat interesting and helpful to you guys. Yeah, Lars, um, I, I hope I can speak for everyone in the club. You know, I, I found this a very uh, empowering uh, presentation. You know, did the step, you know, the, the, the cathartic, you know, thought, you know, the feelings that you're expressing. I think a lot of us get caught up in, um, you see something pretty, you take a picture of it. But as you said, why? What we'll cut your eye? Uh, and, and, and you may not be able to express it. And that's something I've always loved about following your, you on Instagram and stuff are the, the stories that always go along with your photos. So I appreciate the, the presentation tonight. I think it's uh, a lot of good tips. Um, and you know, I will uh, shut up so people can ask questions. But I really thank you for spending the time with us. You're welcome. Thanks so much for having me. This is not something that I do all the time. Uh, so it was kind of weird. And certainly I, if I do this, then I usually do it in person. So um, I hope that I kind of came across what I was trying to say um, in the digital uh, Zoom format as well. Um, I just see a couple questions here already that can kind of be lumped into one, I think. Do you present your verbal stories with your, with your pictures? How do you tell your stories to viewers online, galleries, etc.? cetera? Um, I make it a point of when I present my photos online uh, to um, put that story prominently with that photo. Um, 
when it's on social media, I usually, um, the way I structure my posts or I give the title of the, of the image, then my thoughts, and then the, the image appears, at least when it's on Facebook, on Instagram, it's kind of the other way around because the caption uh, cap, uh, is under the, under the photo. So that's uh, what I do on, online, at least in the social media sphere. Um, on my website, um, I've spent absurd amounts of time uh, building my website. I have done that myself uh, with through YouTube University pretty much. Uh, I'm not a web designer by any chance, but uh, I've there I've tried to really make a visual statement first of the image, build that really big. Um, maybe I'll just pull up my website here so that you guys can actually see what I'm talking about. Um, you're probably still seeing, yeah, I'm still sharing my screen. Okay. Um, okay. So this is the landing page of my, of my homepage, uh, of my, of my website. So there's a whole bunch of, of different stuff, but then you, Lars, you have to um, stop squirt sharing this and then reshare to your website. Cause we're still seeing the, the presentation. Oh, oh, okay. Ah, yes. Um, okay. Stop share. Hold on. And where is oh screen share here um my website here share okay can you see my homepage now okay perfect um so there's that um so then when you go to my collections here and i'm just going to pick like i don't know any image um go here just this red rocks image um the title um which often is sort of the first introduction to how I feel about a certain place. Then the big image, it's ultimately, it's a visual, like we are photographers, so we want to share the, the photo first. And then uh, this is how I always, this is how all of my uh, pages are uh, organized, where I share my, my photos on my website. I have this a note from the artist section, um, where I then tell that story. Um, and there is that little blue chat box thingy integration in the in the right corner um, where people can reach reach out to me and ask me a question about uh, the the photo if they want to if they see it on my website chances are they see it on my on my social media channels first um, that's honestly how I get probably 80 85 percent of my traffic to my website comes through my social media channels um, so you have to be pretty active there if you want to get any kind of real traction, I think, on, on your website these days, or you have to have a really good blog, which I'd love to have, um, because again, I love writing, but I just don't have the time to do that too. Um, so this is sort of the avenue that I've picked for myself. Um, okay, where did the chat window go? When you can't include the whole story as here, how important do you think a title is to understanding the picture? I think a title is super important um, because more than likely, unfortunately, um, not everybody is going to read um, the whole elaborate thought process of yours that you've spent uh, quite some time uh, formulating uh, and putting there. Um, people have short attention spans. And so um, they only uh, may not read the whole thing. So the title is your first way of saying something about the, uh, about the image and also to uh, sort of pique more interest. Um, because if you choose an interesting title that says something about the image, says something about how you feel about the image, and that kind of makes people relate to that image somehow, then they might want to read the whole story. Like here with this Red Rock image, Theater of Dreams. I mean, anybody who has been to Red Rocks, uh, who has seen a show at Red Rocks, knows that it's a special place or anybody who has heard about it. So I feel like there is this, there's more to seeing a show at Red Rocks than just going to hear somebody play some, some music. Um, and it's all about this venue and, uh, this is part of my of my base camp collection where I kind of went out of my comfort zone a little bit and uh, shot closer to closer to home and sort of tried to f to explore that intersection of uh, of uh, nature and our everyday lives uh, a little bit more um, 
and I just feel like that place is is uh, is very special. It's it's a place that I had heard of uh, here in Colorado before I had ever moved here. So um, I mean, I feel like it, that applies to many other people too. Uh, Lars, mm -hmm. can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, this is Dick York. I have a question. I especially like your um, bison uh, image uh, in the uh, high key. The three bison. Yeah, thank you. Family uh, bond. Achieve uh, the the high key. Did you use uh, like a white uh, vignette? Um, ultimately, no. Um, I tried that first, um, but it always looks. It gives this kind of weird effect at the edges, and I didn't want anything to distract from from uh what was in the in the center of the frame a vignette usually at least a darker one pulls your pulls your eye into what is at the center of the image i feel like your eye always wanders first to what's bright and if if the image gets brighter toward the edges that's where your eyes go and then chances are your eyes are going to just leave the image and not come back um so by um sort of just creating this white background which ultimately i spend a lot of time just cloning out individual patches of grass really um and then just kind of like copy uh, copying um cloning uh white spaces that started to um appear as i cloned out uh, uh um certain um certain parts of the issue uh, of the of the image um then Ultimately, that white canvas and that like what that feeling of white of being in a whiteout uh, came together. It just uh, it just didn't work with a with a white white vignette because again, it kind of uh, it pushes your eye. White vignettes push your eye towards the edges of the frame, and most likely uh, in most instances, white. you don't want that to happen. How did you get the white uh, then? Um, again, if we um, um i can try and go back to that let me go back to that slide in the um in the presentation real quick here um where is the presentation here. Um, uh one second so here it is um the f so full screen you can kind of see how here in the um so the left uh upper corner there are some white spots to begin with so I literally started out by um, by removing individual patches of grass, and by doing so, sort of creating bigger white spaces. And then once that happened, I started taking those and with with a clone tool in, in Photoshop. And uh, I'm blanking on the name of the tool right now that I'm using. It's that it's that it looks like a, a patch. Uh, um, by using that tool, I sort of started. Building, uh, building bigger white spaces, and then you can you can grab those by selecting those and copying those into other areas of the images until everything except for what you see in the final image was white. So it was definitely. I'm sure uh, any Photoshop master will tell you what an idiot I am and how long that took me, um, and that I could have done it in five minutes instead of two hours. But um, I like the ultimate result, and uh, so. If you if you know a better technique, that's that's not the white vignette because I did try that first. Um, by all means, please share it. Well, technically, uh, a good vignette is one that you can't tell it's a vignette. Yeah. So you, even if you used it, if it was done right, you shouldn't be able to tell that a vignette was used. That is true. Which unfortunately, oftentimes is 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 not the case when you when you look at images and. Uh, so I use them, I wow. often use vignettes. Um, I usually use dark vignettes uh, just to kind of draw everything, the eye more into, into the center of the screen. Um, like uh, oh, the next one actually here. I use a vignette here, a uh, dark one, a dark one. Um, but I usually try and use it not too heavy handed, uh, to put it that way. This is, this is more heavy handed, this vignette here, than I would actually usually use. Now, is this panoramic or just one image or multiple images? No, it's multiple images. I think it's, uh, it's stitched, it's 15 or so single exposures st stitched together. It's also because I'm, uh, honestly, a lot of the panoramas that I shoot, I 
usually um, shoot more single uh, single exposures uh, because I'm still shooting with the Canon 5D Mark III. So my sensor has limited uh, megapixel availability and I try to print my images really big. Um, and so by just stitching a whole bunch of photos together, I usually get a much bigger file that I can print bigger, much easier. Problem uh, vertical format. Yeah. Yeah. So even if so, even uh, even a lot of my um, not all of them, but some of my three by two images uh, or some of my square images even are uh, ultimately uh, stitched together. Like this one, for example, is um, three um, three single exposures stitched together um, in in uh, Lightroom and then Photoshop afterward. Just. Well, I <laughs> yes, it allows me to just print. Like ultimately, the the answer why I do it is uh, it's a pain in the butt to do it. It's two or three more steps in post processing, but it allows me to print this bigger. If I shot this in in one by one on my on my camera, I would have trouble printing this in twenty by twenty or thirty by thirty. Um, shooting it in three single exposures and stitching them together, I can print this in thirty by thirty easily. Um, without losing any quality, without having to blow it up at all. Yeah, it's very nice. And Lars, um, in your defense, you know, back on that family bonds image, I think I just asked you, did you shoot that at Genesee? You said no, and I didn't pry any further because <laughs> with, yeah, all the, uh, with all the Instagram things going on and people not – sharing sometimes, you know, because they don't want a million people trampling the environment to death or whatever. I thought I'm not going to push him on it. So it's not that you were hiding it. I just, you said no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was um, the arsenal just outside Denver, um, which Did you just I'm go sure you all know was an awesome place. I shot it with a 400 millimeter, that one. And so, you were like right up uh, looking through the little wire fence, so you had to not deal with any of that? Just got your lens sticking through it? No, I actually was. Um, that one I actually shot out of my car. Um, they were pretty close to the road. Um, so if you go, if you do the full loop, kind of before you come back uh, through the fence, you're not supposed to get out of your car. So I, I didn't. Um, I shot it out of the car with the 400 millimeter, but they were... I don't know, 50 yards from the road or so, and they just lined up for a minute or two, and then they kind of shuffled around again, and it kept kind of happening, but this is the image definitely that I like the most. It was just really cool to see how, I guess, the weather got worse and conditions got worse. They definitely like, all moved together and kind of tried to protect each other that way, and I just thought it was a super powerful thing to see. But there's a message from Larry, not a question, but thanking you. Uh, very helpful. Took many notes. Hopefully I can get make some progress on my mission in storytelling. You did a great job showing and explaining many things. Well, thank you very much. And again, if you have any, if you have any questions at all, um, Sean or anybody, uh, I don't know if you or whoever will email out that um, handout, some of the things that I went uh, through today are, are on there, including some of the like, more hands-on type things. And then it has my contact information. And um, I, Sean, you mentioned it at the beginning, and I would be remiss to not mention it myself now, even though this sort of goes against what my being is. But yeah, I do. I, I am working on this workshop series and this training series where um, I try to teach this stuff to, to people and go into much more detail than I can in an hour or an hour and a half presentation. So there is a link on that handout to just uh, sign up for a newsletter at this point. Um, and uh, on that newsletter, I send out just brief emails for now with just kind of quick tips. And uh, then if you ever feel inclined to uh, work with me in a workshop or in an online training or in a one-on-one -on -one, uh, sort of consulting session or whatever where, where we can go into much more details into critiques of your own images. I'd be more than happy to do that. And that offer uh, is there. It's something that I am trying to do to, to do more of because again, today I uh, realized that I do enjoy uh, 
teaching this stuff to to other people and talking about it because it is such a personal thing for me and what I do and how I approach my photography is so deeply personal that um, it's really cool when people actually seem to see something in that that they can apply to uh, to their own uh, photography. So it's there for you guys if you if you want it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. As uh, as Lars mentioned, he emailed me a, a PDF file, so um, I'll send it out or I'll get it to Carl because I think he has the list built and he can email it to everyone, and then you can sign up for Lars's uh, newsletter. And again, feel free to reach out with with individual questions. I'm not going to charge you for answering a, a answering an email. So please. Uh, Let's not get let's not get that uh, tangled up. I I want to I want to be available for for people to share this. All right. Well, if there are no other questions or comments, um, I think we'll let Lars get to finishing his packing <laughs> uh, so he can go enjoy the mountains this weekend. Um, appreciate it very much, uh, Larry. Did you have anything to add? had unmute myself. No, uh, it was a great presentation. Lars is a great teacher. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Larry. And the, uh, I, I guess we belong to the same introvert club, but uh, we, we come through when we need to, huh? You can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> great program. Thank you. All right. Thank All you guys right. very much for having me tonight and listening. All right. Thank you, Lars. Take care. All right, thanks. Bye. All right. Cheers. Bye. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, Larry. Oh, sure. That was that was enjoyable. Adios.